Hey guys, Toby Mathis here, and I'm joined by Mike Michalowicz, uh, the author of Profit First and uh, uh, a bunch of other books. I'm just going to read through them real quick because you've done so many Get Different, Fix This Next, Clockwork, Pumpkin Plan, Surge, uh, The Toilet Paper, Entrepreneur, and uh, most recently, the one that we really want to talk about today is All In. So first off, welcome, Mike. Toby, thanks for having it's, uh, me. It, it's great to talk to a fellow author. Nobody knows how hard it is to to birth these books. I I, I say birth because that's what it yeah. feels like, and then and then and you're like, oh, <laughs> right? Yeah. For each book, it takes me roughly three to five years from concept to collating and um, codifying to finally producing the book. And so I've produced many books, but I'm working on parallel right now. I have three concepts I'm working on for years trying to push forward um, it's hard it's hard let's do this before we get into all in uh maybe give them a you know an easy guide to understanding the library that you've created and you know most people know profit first if you haven't read profit first that's the one yep. that you'll have every accountant going yes because they talk about percentages and you know and actually looking at different size businesses and how those percentages move and that it's not universal for everybody uh, but give us a, the thumbnail sketch of, of the different works you put together, who they're for, and then, you know, how it would benefit somebody. Sure. So Profit First, we'll start there. That is my most popular book. What I do is I challenge the standard accounting notion called gap where profit comes last. Sales minus expense equals profit. And what I teach is that sales minus profit equals expenses. So basically the pay yourself first system applied to business, which can be a profound mind shift. But it's a massive behavioral shift too, because when we take our profit first, we guarantee profitability. So that's profit first. I think the book that's kind of the center of the universe of books I've done, if that's the right word, is Fix This Next. And the biggest challenge that entrepreneurs have is we try to fix everything and then we get frustrated when nothing is fixed. So Fix This Next is a strategy to identify the weakest link in your business currently, the vital need, I call it. And the example is if there was a chain between me and you, Toby, and we had to fix the chain, the mistake would be to fix every link. The right thing is fix the weakest link and the entire chain strength elevates to the next weakest link. So you, you'd ping pong around. And that's what organizations actually need to do. Fix this next to the system to do it. I won't go through every book, but a couple other ones. Uh, Clockwork is about business efficiency. What I identified is the biggest form of entrepreneurial poverty and struggle is actually not financial poverty, it's time poverty the sacrifices we make as entrepreneurs is off the charts, sacrificing family and friends and personal life and everything for the business. And sadly, it's promoted by some pundits like hustle and grind, you know, burn yourself out. And that's total nonsense. The thesis of this book is the number one job of an entrepreneur is not to do the job, it's to be a creator of jobs. And it teaches you that trajectory to designing a business, to overseeing a business, but not being inside the business. So that's what Clockwork's about. And then just a couple others, uh, Pumpkin Plan was a book I wrote specifically on organic growth. I used a technique called biomimicry. I looked at colossal pumpkin farmers specifically. They change the growing process by a few things and it spawns massive growth. Well, I translated it using biomimicry techniques and said, my gosh, there's applications to business. So that's Pumpkin Plan. And then uh, All Ends, my most recent book and the last book I'll make mention of is, is called Get Different. Get Different is uh, my approach to marketing. And what I realized is most of us market the way our competition markets because that's the obvious way to market. But it triggers this thing called habituation to the consumer. When, when we see the same message and it wasn't effective the first time, we already know it's not relevant or effective the second time, so we don't even consider it. So we have to do what's different than everybody else to get noticed. And then once you get noticed, how do you capture that in a positive uh, way that empowers the consumer to make a buying decision? I was yes, so all of them seem like they're applicable to the, the business owner out there. So, you know, so for everybody that's listening, uh, you just went through a really good library of things that you could do to get your, you know, to give you good ideas, track things appropriately, and make sure you don't fall into the traps um, that take us out. And, and this is where I want to go next. And it's not everybody's favorite thing to talk about, right? It's our failures. Yeah. And where and and what were the hard lessons you've learned? I, I I could say my own, but I'm really interested in what are the ones that where you face planted, and now you're writing these to make sure somebody else doesn't follow suit. Yeah. So 
every single book I've, here's the hidden secret. Every single book I've written is something I have or am struggling with and I'm finding a solution. I own multiple businesses now and we deploy it. I had multiple face plants. The, the biggest one, I sold two companies. I thought I was God's gift to entrepreneurship. I had made millions in my early thirties. And then I start spending money as a venture capitalist. I wasn't a venture capitalist as, as barely an angel investor. I now call myself the angel of death. I, I had no idea what I was doing and I lost everything. And it was out of vanity. It was out how of much, ignorance. How much did you lose? Um, Just put it in perspective. Oh, a couple million, a couple million. Let that simmer for a second. You're handed a 2 million bucks. Is, is, was it more than 2 million or? Oh yeah, it was more than 2 million, but then taxes oh. came. Um, so that, that was the first wake up call. You sell a business. And it's like over half a, not half, but a big chunk third. went away. It's like, what? Third. Yeah, third, it's a third that goes, vanishes. I had no clue, no perception. And I also did another face plant was I was spending before we sold our company. So I, in my head, I'm like, oh, this is my new lifestyle. And we're just weeks or months away that got stretched and stretched. It was a strategy by the acquirer. It was a public company that did a, you know, sell high or, or offer high and then low ball. It was a high ball, low ball. Then they ground and you down, right? Yeah, they got the hook in and then they ground yeah. you down. They got you to think you're going to have the money in your head. You're already spending it. Oh my gosh. It's like class. I wish I, I wish I knew that. You told me, you should have told me. So totally got burned and I deserved it because I, I would hook on sinker. So that was one of the biggest face plans. So just pure ignorance. Um, but I, I've made leadership mistakes. Actually, in, in most, actually every book, I reveal the reason, the impetus behind uh, something I've written because of a failure I've had personally. So my my newest book on leadership and people, uh, I remember coming out of my office one day and, and calling the team together. It was my computer forensics business. We were doing crime investigation. I had 30 employees at a brick and mortar place. I ran the numbers. I'm like, we can do $10 million this year. I wrote $10 million in bubble layers on the wall, put a big post-it note over it, and then called everyone in and with great flair. I'm like, this is the year of $10 million. And everyone's like, whatever, and sulked back to the office. I'm like, this is my dream. This is the dream of the company. This is our vision. Why is everyone into it? And my assistant said, Mike, if we achieve 10 million, you get the bigger house. You get the new car. What about our dreams? What about our vision? And it was a wake-up call that the dream or mission of a company is the vision of the leader, and it's, it's self-fulfilling. We need to care for our colleagues' personal visions too. That's actually a really good point. And this is a good segue. So right now we're sitting at, you know, historical <laughs> low unemployment rates. And that may change very yeah. quickly, right? You know, the Fed's doing its best to to screw things up and cause earnings to drop, which is going to make, <laughs> you know, what, well, it is what it is. It's like they target unemployment. So what you do is you make it more yeah. expensive for, for, um, for everything. You know, inflation drives up when you make uh, debt more expensive and companies have to make their profitability like profit first, right? These companies aren't dumb. Yeah. They're like, hey, our bottom line, we have to bring the, the bottom line. How do we, what are we gonna cut? Personnel is usually one of the easy low lying fruit. Hey, let's let go of 10,000 people all at once and look at all the money we save and all that goes to the bottom line because it doesn't really impact things right away. It's gonna, it's gonna take a while and they yeah. absolutely do it. So, so it's, it's relevant. How do you compete in this marketplace? Sure. And how does what you're talking about, I, I, I know this is multiple questions, but how does, how does it give you the advantage as the business? And then also as the employee, like these concepts, I think are not just for the business, but it also helps the individual as well. For sure. And, and there's elements, there's recruiting. So recruiting is going to happen. There's going to be a clean out of employees and then companies are gonna have to recover. It is, to your point, it is often necessary. These companies can be vil villainized, but, but the reality is profitability translates to sustainability. If businesses are operating at a loss for a sustained period, not 10,000 people, but the whole 100,000 people lose their jobs. So there is this peculiar and difficult balance. There's a recruiting component, there's a retention component, and there's a raising the bar. How do you get people elevated? I think I want to start off with recruiting because I think there's a great aha here that can be transformative for employers and for employees. What I did was I studied how do most businesses uh, recruit? And what they do is they run some kind of advertisements on platform de jour. They then go through an interview process. And the result is about five, 10% 10 of the people max are an ideal fit. I mean, this is ideally suited for them. They're very capable and they become rock star employees, as they say. 
it's a very bad method. So I said, gosh, there's got to be a better, better outcome. We all want to have a great fit as an employee. We all, as employers, want to have a great fit for us, but the results are horrible. So what's wrong with the method? So I looked at other industries and I found, and it's so obvious in retrospect, I found a half trillion dollar industry that's never run an interview in its life. It always has top talent. People are highly engaged. And it's the sports industry. It, like, there's, there's not a single football team that says, hey, just let's, let's talk about your resume um, and maybe you're a fit. No, let's hit the field. The, the transformation we need to make as employers is move from a interview format to, I call them workshops or camps. So let me give a sports analogy and I'll give you practical examples of companies doing this. I actually experienced myself. I, I played sports. I was an average athlete in high school. I played lacrosse. But during lacrosse, I was uh, invited or my parents wanted me to go to a camp uh, called Hobart. It's in the Northeast. They're a lacrosse camp. They have 500 students there. And it's considered one of the better camps. As I'm going through this, I'm practicing. I, my skills were improving and so were the other athletes. But I noticed and didn't put thought into it. Some of those athletes were getting tapped on the shoulder and invited to go to another field to advance skills even further because they were showing potential. And ultimately, at the end of the camp, three of those students were offered scholarships to play at Hobart. Not one of them, not one of them. But here's the thing. I played collegiate lacrosse uh, after that. And a big part is attributed to the skills I learned at that camp. So here's the lesson. Employers that run educational, experiential events educate and enhance people for the work environment wherever they end up. And the employer can cherry pick and the employee can cherry pick the best fits for themselves right there in that moment. So this isn't a recruiting camp. It's not show me your skills. This is let me educate you. People who want to be educated show desire, thirst, potential, and those people can be cherry picked. Now, here's a real world example. Corporations are already doing this, just not enough. And I think someone listening in can do this right now. Home Depot has a recruiting camp. And uh, what you do is you go to build a birdhouse and they have these ads like, come on, I learned to build a birdhouse. They don't say, hey, we're seeing who good candidates are for employment. They say, build a birdhouse. And we're like, oh, this is amazing. So we go down, maybe with your kid and you build a birdhouse. A few things happen. First, you become ingratiated with the stores. Like this is an amazing experience and I love Home Depot. Maybe you buy stuff. There's an employee sitting there that's observing the participation of the parents and say, hey, uh, to the right parent, taps them on the shoulder and says, you really showed a lot of potential here. You, you were helping other parents and stuff. You're the type of candidate we love having work at Home Depot. Would you have any interest? It's a recruiting platform. So the tip for your listeners here is run educational workshops. They can be virtual or in person and observe your students to cherry pick the best student. And if you don't want to run a workshop, if that's too much, simply attend a workshop. I'm looking to hire a bookkeeper. I'm not going to run a bookkeeping workshop. I, I have to hire someone to do that. It's too much. I'm going to a class for bookkeepers as a student. But what I'm really doing is observing the other students to identify the person with the most potential. Can you do that virtually? You can do it virtually for sure. And you're not restricted to the recruiting pool of people who are looking for jobs. This is educational. So you're now open up to anyone seeking education. We worked with a... Uh, preschool that was looking for new site directors, and I won't go into the technical details, they reached out to other preschools and said, hey, we're having a training session for site directors. If you have a preschool teacher that is interested in this and you want to support them in this trajectory, we're teaching them. And by the way, we're charging $100 per student. So the competition sent their preschool teachers and paid for it. This event was educational, but we simply observed and we cherry picked people and said, wow, you, you could be a site director. We have a job opportunity. They were integral. They said, if, if you like your current employer and they have a job, go for it. But if you want to grow into this and there's no opportunity for you, we surely have one. So it became a recruiting platform. The last thing I want to share is every single person gets better during the process. Hire them or not, everyone's learning skills along the way. Wow. Uh, can, can you give more examples of how this might, like, I love the concrete real life examples. Oh, I can yes. give you countless. So, okay. So I'll give you two more. I'll give you a big company and small company. Big company was Domino's Pizza. Domino's Pizza during the COVID pandemic created an app called, I think it was called Pizza Hero. What you could do is you could design a pizza. You could lay out the pepperoni in as a smiley face or circles or whatever. When you push submit, it would make an order for your pizza and get delivered, which sounds like, wow, this is a cool, fun experience. And I can do whatever I want and I'm buying. They were observing to find chefs. Here's what they did. 
they noticed that some people would spend more time on the app. Some people are spending a half hour designing the perfect pizza. They were surely showing a high degree of potential intrigue and interest, at least in the video game. So they said, hey, we noticed you spent a lot of time working on the pizza. Are you interested in coming down to one of the Domino's stores? We'll show you how to make your own pizza. And that became the next measurement. They hired over 500 uh, chefs or cooks out of an app by doing a class. Uh, I'll give you another big world example. Uh, Audible, who makes you know audiobooks, they're doing a thing not called internships, but returnships. They're approaching people who've left the workforce for a period of time due to illness or whatever it may be the reason, and are looking to re-enter the workforce, but have a gap of, of a few years or a decade and need to get up to speed. You can go to Audible and learn what current professional standards are, what new technology is, and they'll teach you the process. I think it's a 12-week program, so you really get to learn a lot. And during the process, they are observing and cherry picking people who are fit for Audible. So again, educate to identify. I'll, I'll give you one last example just to give you tons of stuff. There was a bookkeeping firm in New York. Uh, the owner, her name is Tuesday Brooks. And I was talking with Tuesday and she said it was really hard in this environment, this is really recently, to recruit people. There's no one available and no one wants to be a bookkeeper. Mm -hmm. So she said, I'm going to approach uh, a, a university offshore she happens to be uh, from Nairobi, Africa, I think it was, from Kenya. And she teamed up with a Nairobi university. And what they did is they put on a workshop that she created around bookkeeping skills. She then, with the adjunct professor that was there, she remotely gave the class through recordings and then asked the adjunct professor, identify which of these students are the most engaged. Potential always comes out through engagement, desire, thirst. By the end of the course, she hired three bookkeepers. They're rock stars for her, the best bookkeepers. But my favorite part of that story is the other nine students that went through it all have become employed as bookkeepers. So everyone- all of a sudden they said, hey, you know what? Uh, maybe this is something. I mean, sounds like they actually taught them the skill. Did, did the nine come work for, for her or did they go work uh, in just in bookkeeping field? But the booking field. So she hired three. She cherry picked the best fits for her. Everyone else has capabilities, but there's other matches besides the ability to do something. It's your cultural fit and, and your natural tendencies. So she cherry picked the three best for her and their rock stars. Those other nines all got hired by large or corporations or small or somewhere Mike, in between. Is elsewhere. this all, is this all in your book, all in? Oh, absolutely. So I, I challenged the standard notions of recruiting, retaining, and raising the bar. And what I did is I looked at what's the outcome we want, rockstar employees, what's the method we follow, interviewing, what's the outcome, abysmal. And every time I saw this pattern of outcome and uh, desire and outcome mismatching, I fixed the, I, I addressed the method and researched it. So this is one of them. The other one is, uh, that's a really big one, is how do you empower employees to feel and act like owners? I would like to d dive into that. I used to have a phrase here, uh, ownership isn't doership. You know, you can own a project, you don't have to do it. And you're trying to get, because uh, not to relate this to, to my business, but it's the way I understand things is you're looking at folks that may not be, have a necessary skill set to do something, but you still want them to feel like they own the project. Is, is that something that's in there? And, and, if, and if so, or, you know, however it is, maybe just explain it for a couple of minutes. Yeah, it's absolutely in there. I, I devoted a, a, a big portion of the book to this because it's such an important principle. What I found is there is a distinct difference in behavior between legal ownership and psychological ownership. And if you want someone to act like an owner, including yourself, it's only psychological ownership that wins. So quick example, legal ownership. I own some stock in Ford. I drove by a Ford factory a few days ago and I looked over it and I did not say or feel, oh, I own a few bricks in that building. That's, that's my Ford, go for it. No, actually, I felt entitled. I looked at the factory and said, where's my dividend check? The values better go up. Legal ownership alone results in a form of entitlement. There's an expectation. This is my possession. You owe me. Psychological ownership is an identif identification alignment. My identity is part of the object. So how do you invoke psychological ownership? There's three things that always trigger it. First is the ability to personalize. So I have a Ford truck is, is the car I drive. And uh, I am able to program the radio stations my way. I can put a bumper sticker on if I want and hang dice from the mirror, uh, the rear view mirror. I decide. That personalization makes me uh, have a closer affinity. The second thing is intimate knowledge. The more detail you know about something, I know what every button and thing does. 
I know inside now, I read through the whole manual of the day. It pulled in the drive. I was like, I got to read this whole manual. So I have intimate knowledge. And the last part is control. I decide when I drive it, where I drive it, where I park it and so forth. But here's the irony. I don't have legal, legal ownership. I have bank notes I'm paying. I, you know, the bank owns it until I make my final installment. So I don't have legal by psychological ownership. It is mine. So when someone says it's mine or ours, they're demonstrating a sense of ownership. So with our employees, our colleagues, what we have to do is give them the ability to personalize. I was saying, if you force people to comply, they will seek to defy. It's a subconscious response. So if I tell my employee, this is what you have to do, and if you fail to do, you're gonna be in trouble, yeah, they may do it, but they're gonna start elbowing their way out and, and seek to defy it. If I say, here's what we're, we're, I'm looking at, and I want you to look at it with me, how can you make this your own? What's your vision for this? I start giving them the authority to personalize it. More personalization has a greater sense of ownership. I invite them then to, to determine the outcome. What's, what's your ideas around this project? Where could you see taking it? Where, how do you want, what path do you wanna follow? There's a sense of control. And then also intimate knowledge. I give them exposure to as much components as possible. I encourage them to learn. They have more ownership. Do you wanna share, there's one big risk factor here. If you give all the authority over something, you can cause fiefdoms. This is mine, no one else gets it, and they start becoming defensive. So we wanna achieve the highest form of ownership, which is called collective psychological ownership, where we feel it's something that's our collective ownership. So for every role and function that I have here, I always have at least two people involved in it, and they say, this is our job. So we don't have a bookkeeper, but we have bookkeeping that's handled by a few people. And they say, we do the bookkeeping. It's our bookkeeping responsibility. That's what we want to do with our team. Yeah, and even then, do you still get five times, even if it's like two or three people? Do you ever see where they start kind of, this is ours and stay away from it? Less and less. So the more people that are involved, the less likely you're to get that fiefdom. So you want to have more people you can, but there's a practicality to it. You can't have a hundred people yeah. doing things. Um, I'll give you a real world example since you like this. Uh, there was a smokehouse in um, Texas, a barbecue house in Texas. And uh, the owner had an employee who was a C player as the, and I hate these labels, but that's a common label. Ill performer, didn't show up on time and so forth. The owner, Steven, deployed psychological ownership with Joel, who was this employee. And he started off slow. This is the first tip. Joel was not performing well at all. So what he did, he said, hey, there's a straw box on the bar there. And every time someone takes a straw, it explodes everywhere. Um, I want someone to take ownership over this. Would you be interested? What's your thoughts? Uh, how can you make this to your standard? Personalization, ownership. And Joel's like, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll take it. And, and here's how I see it. Well, the, the, the straw box now is ordered and organized perfectly. It was Joel's straw box. Fast forward a few days later, it became the bar mat. By the end of the week, he was also doing the cooler. It did take a few years, but Joel now has control or he manages the restaurant. He is their number one performing employee. And to me, it was profound. A C player goes to A player. So I called him up. I said, Joel, why did you do this? How did you become so good? And he said, Steve, the owner didn't know my background, but I, he goes, I, I had a pretty tough background. My parents told me I was worthless and that I would never own anything. Here's the first guy that was empowering me because I feel so empowered here. He's like, I'm in with this smokehouse for the rest of my life. I'll do anything for this company. That's the power of, of ownership. That's pretty extraordinary. Now, now let's flip it on its ear a little bit because because uh, we're talking about it from the ownership standpoint, uh, you know, from people that own their businesses. What if you're an employee out there? How can you use these principles yeah. to benefit yourself? Well, one of the things that we need to take ownership over and we have to work collaboratively with our team and the leaders, if you will, of our team, but it becomes the mo most empowering thing is personal vision. So here's a lesson. I, I came out of my office. I say, here's my vision. We're going to do $10 million in revenue. I had this great, glorious announcement. My employees are looking at me when I'm making this announcement about the vision of the company saying, well, Mike, that's, that's your dream. What about yeah. us? I remember my assistant saying, if we achieve 10 million, Mike, you get the bigger house and the new car. Why should we care? What about our visions? And that was the aha. I was like, I am an idiot. My colleague, Amy, uh, is fighting cancer uh, and she's cancer free now going on her fifth year. And she said, this is the most important thing in my personal health right now. Another person here wants to buy their first house. Another person wants to learn how to start playing guitar. 
dreams can be of, and visions can be of all different sizes, but they're all significant and important. The job of the leader and the job of the colleague is to voice what we want for ourselves. Then what we do is start building groups amongst your team. So you're employed by a company, talk with the other colleagues and say, hey, why don't we meet once a week and talk about personal vision? Start empowering each other. When you start rooting on your colleague, they'll start rooting you on. And it now becomes a brand, I was gonna say a band of brothers, but a band of brothers and sisters locked arms and we're walking together. When I realized this, even you know, for my own business, that $10 million, that's my personal dream. That, that, that satisfies a part of my big fat ego. But what matters to everyone else is just as important to me. And when every employee starts looking at each other's visions and dreams and plans for their lives and sees that as equal importance, we all start stepping forward. So as, as an employee, start having those conversations today with your team, with your friends, with your colleagues that's, at work. Uh... It's pretty profound, and I can say 100% I agree with you, and it's been my experience too. And every time we see mm. personnel issues and things like that, it's usually deficiency at the top. You know, we, we, it's fun to blame everybody else, but uh, a lot of times you got to go look in the mirror and say, I'm the, uh, it's it's on me. It's tough. It's tough. I've had to face myself in the mirror. So, and and I, I think I'm such a benevolent leader. I'm so nice and caring. But there's these blinders, this ignorance I have. And um, I, I realized I was steadfast in what I wanted and assuming that people would align. I'll share another thing that employees can do and, and leaders can do, and it's this concept of culture. I was a big believer that when I started my organization, I'm going to define the culture. And if people fit the culture, you're a fit. And if you don't, you shouldn't be part of it. And now I've concluded that is the wrong move. What happens is a siloing effect. So I have certain rules. And when I get people that follow the same kind of rule set values, then I get an echo chamber of my beliefs. I've now discovered that it's actually diversity. People have different opinions and different values. Maybe they, hopefully we all agree with the mission, what we're trying to do as an organization, but we all have different approaches. A great leader will encourage differing opinions and engage everyone. And so what happens is instead of culture, we build something even greater, which is called community. And community happens naturally. The town you live in, stuff. the more diverse it is, the richer the community becomes. And so in an organization, the more diversity we have, the more we encourage differing opinions and different vantage points, naturally, builds a stronger community. That was a big aha. That's really me. interesting. And I, 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 I'd love to sit here and chat with you on this all day long because there's so many things that are, apply to mm. right now what we're going through as a country and everything else and, and how yeah. we break out of our silos because uh, we definitely echo chambers and silos sounds uh, very much like what's going on in the U S but this is about your book. <laughs> this true. is about all in, this is about you. Um, how does like, I'm assuming you just type it in and go to Amazon and, and, and get all in. Uh, but uh, where would somebody, I, like I went to your site and I ended up downloading a bunch of other materials that came along with it. Oh, is, thank you. Is that what you would encourage people to do? Yeah, I would start there. I mean, by all means, you can get Amazon, your favorite bookstore. Um, but if you go to, well, there's two sites I'll give you. All In by Mike, that's the book site. So if you want specifically strategies, I have free strategies just so you can get started the second. But my website is mikemotorbike.com. Now, my name's Michalowicz. No one can spell that. Mike Motorbike is a nickname back from grade school. That was the only PG nickname I ever had. And at MikeMotorbike.com, you'll find book downloads. I used to write for the Wall Street Journal. I have a podcast. It's all there at Mike Motorbike. Perfect. Well, I'm going to encourage people to go do that. I want to say thank you, Mike, for sharing with us. Uh, you know what? Uh, I just like talking to other business owners that get it and are always looking to get better. And I, I think you just really brought it. So I just thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing oh, this with everybody. That means the world to me. Thank you for saying that.